Born to a poor cobbler, he rose to become the undisputed ruler of the biggest nation on earth and to attempt a world revolution. With us today, the man who knows Joseph Stalin perhaps better than anyone ever has, Stephen Kotkin, author of Stalin. Uncommon Knowledge, now. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge, I'm Peter Robinson. The John P. Berkland Professor in History and International Affairs at Princeton University, Stephen Kotkin is also a fellow at the Hoover Institution here at Stanford. Dr. Kotkin is the author of a number of books, most recently, Stalin, Paradoxes of Power, 1878 to 1928. Note that this book is volume one of a projected three-volume series about Joseph Stalin and his time. The review in the New York Times called Stalin, quote, masterful, close quote, which shows that even the New York Times can from time to time get something just exactly right. Stephen Kotkin, welcome. Thank you, Peter. First things first, Stalin, Volume 1, Paradoxes of Power, 1878 to 1928. He's born in 1878. Got it. Why do you end Volume 1 in 1928? 1928 is when Stalin makes the decision to collectivize agriculture, or that is to enslave the peasantry, a hundred million plus people in Eurasia. And the question is, not only why did he do that, but how was it possible that he could accumulate the power to be able to enslave a hundred million people? So the book tries to put in context this decision, the so-called collectivization of agriculture, and to give it a sense of the sweep of Russian history, the geopolitics of the time, Stalin's personality, and of course the mechanisms of power. All right. Let me quote the book to you, Stephen. Stalin, quote, subjects of biography often are portrayed as forming their personalities, including their views about authority and obedience, that is about power, in childhood, and especially the family. But do we really need to locate the wellsprings of Stalin's politics or even his troubled soul in beatings he allegedly received as a child in Gori? Close quote. Begin with a little boy in Gori. You know, so Stalin is born in a market town. It's not a big city, but it's also not a complete backwater. It's an ancient trading center on the trade routes, Near East, Europe, Russia. And... In that market town, his parents are strivers. The father is a cobbler who's looking to become a kind of self-standing artisan with his own business. Uh, the mother takes various different jobs in order to help with the education of her child. Because of the Russian Orthodox Church, which generally is not a, um, a front and center story in, among Russian historians, because of the Russian Orthodox Church, there's a school in the town, as a result of which there's the possibility of a future for the, the young kids. Because little Yosef Jugashvili learns to read and write at a time when that might not have been so standard? It's, it's the Russian Orthodox Church, and he's Georgian. So his native language is Georgian. But his mother sends him to a priest who has several sons, and that priest teaches him Russian. And so he's able, on the basis of this knowledge of Russian, to enter the school. In Can fact, I, he does well at the school. How closely related are the two languages? I've never, is this like Italian and Spanish? No, or? they're not related at all. They're two entirely different languages, and knowing one helps you nothing uh, with it. learning the other. So that was an... So, so, so it's a big accomplishment. big accomplishment. He does very well at school. He studies hard. He's the teacher's pet. He sings in the choir. He wants to become a priest or a monk. Uh, which is not unusual for outstanding students in a parish school run by, uh, by the church. There's no university in the Caucasus. The czarist regime is afraid of university students because university students have their own ideas, including ideas about politics. And so they refuse to open a university locally. And so the highest educational institutions locally are the gymnasium or the elite high schools, and the seminary, the Orthodox seminary, where they train priests in Tiflis, which is the capital of Georgia and the capital of the South Caucasus. Mm -hmm. And Stalin gets admitted into the seminary. 
which is not easy, and in fact, he gets a state scholarship because he's an outstanding student. He then, once again, does very well at school, near the top of his class. Uh, again, the teacher's pet. Teacher's pet means, of course, that he snitches on the other students, as you know from school yourself, right? <laughs> and, however, he ends up giving all of that up. He's on the pathway to success. He's got a bright future. But instead, he joins the revolutionary underground right. and spends the next two decades of his life on the run, okay. in prison, in exile, Stop there. without money. Before we get, him at, we, we get him into the seminary, I just want to make sure I understand yeah. this correctly. So even as, for example, if you read up on the early years of Ronald Reagan, mm. you see right from the get-go charm. Yes. People liked him from the time he was a little kid. Yes. And with Stalin, what you see right from the get-go is smarts and a certain yes. ambition. Is that right? Correct. Uh, He's often the leader of the stuff that happens in the streets. You know, kids play in the street. Every kid growing up in this epoch is playing in the streets. But he's often the self-appointed or the chosen leader of the group of children. He's not physically as adept as some of the other kids. Some accidents have happened to him. He's got a couple of birth defects. How, how big is he? How tall is he? He's about five foot seven. Eventually, as a fully grown adult, he's a slight child, but he's stocky. He's wiry and muscular. He's one of the smaller kids at school. He's about two inches shorter than Hitler, if people know Hitler's height. All right. Hitler's not a giant either. Hitler's about five nine, but Stalin's about Churchill's five, seven. about five six, as I recall. Is that yes. right? Okay. Yes. All right. So it's 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 not a especially small, but he's he's not very large either. But he's physically active. So in other words, what we're talking about is force of personality, not a physical presence. Yes, force right. of personality and ambition. Mm -hmm. And the ambition expresses itself through reading and acquiring knowledge and bettering himself. He wants to be somebody of significance and being somebody of significance through education. That obviously comes from his mother, very strongly stressing education for him. Now, there are all sorts of stories about Stalin's childhood. These stories are mostly reminiscences of people later in life. So after he's murdered many, many hundreds of thousands of people, they remember, ah, oh, you know, I knew when we were on the playground when he was 11 and he said, I'm going to get all you guys, that he was going to kill everybody in the country, right? So those reminiscences fill up a lot of the biographies. Some of them could be true, but I refuse to use any of them. The only sources I'll use about Stalin are the ones where it's said in real time and recorded in real time. What did they say about him in 1915? What did they say about him in 1920, in 1925? Right. Well, so back to the seminary, because it, it could almost be the case, I find myself thinking as I'm reading that early chapter, he's just going to use the seminary to get ahead. But that isn't quite, you push against that. This is one place where you do quote a later reminiscence, but it, it seems to fit the evidence of the time. Yes. Stalin was very much a believer. This is someone later remembering what it was like in the old days. Stalin was very much a believer going to all the services, singing the church choir. He not only observed all religious rites, but always reminded us to observe them. Yes. And, and that's he goes issued. in a real believer and comes out a communist. How did that happen? Yeah, that's the moment, that's right? A, that's certainly a great story. I'll use the reminiscences if there's more than one of them, if okay. they're backed up by another one. And moreover, remembering that he was religious is something that is published while he's a communist dictator. And so if it's published while he's a communist dictator, it goes against the communist militant godlessness. And so it rings of truth because it doesn't fit the regime right. ideology Testimony or image of him. against interest, so to speak. Right. Yeah, okay. So what happens is... Tsarist Russia is not a pretty place. It's very oppressive. Politics are illegal. They don't have a parliament. They don't have a constitution. Until 1905-06, after losing the war with the Japanese, they don't have a legal parliament. You cannot participate in politics. And so, if you don't like what you see, if you see injustice, if you see incompetence, if you see embezzlement, there's kind of no way to organize against it because all political activity, as I said, is illegal. And so on, under these circumstances, you get a revolutionary underground, meaning opposition to czarist regime, social injustice and incompetence takes the form of underground politics. Not always because of choice, 
but because there's kind of no other option. And even when they, the Tsar will grant a constitution and a quasi-parliament, the 1905-06 events, still many things are illegal, censorship, political associations, which are not sanctioned by the authorities. So there's a very large population of people who feel the Tsarist regime is oppressive and want to do something about it, and they enter the revolutionary. So he does that, too. But remember, it's a risk. Mm -hmm. He's giving up a successful life, a successful trajectory, for a life of fighting for justice, but that's not a profession. That's not going to pay him a salary. That's not going to make him the owner of a house or a farm or anything else. And so he's going to lead a life of impoverishment of prison and exile, of police harassment and persecution for more than 20 years, essentially, from about 1898, well, 19 years, till 1917, right? When unexpectedly there's a revolution in Russia, but right. no one expected that to happen. So it's a big commitment to be an underground revolutionary fighting for social justice because you see that the czarist regime It is wasn't oppressive. a phase. He wasn't just a hot-headed young man. He didn't grow out of it. It became a Correct. permanent commitment. Some people did give it up, but so, he didn't. Uh, obviously, we need to come to the revolution, which is worth shows and shows and volumes and volumes on its own. We need to do that briefly. But before we get to the revolution, mm. I don't even know how to frame the question tightly. How bad was the czarist regime? I, I've always been struck that Stalin is placed in exile in Siberia half a dozen times. Yeah. And it seems he to be escapes. the case he's able to wander off. They're not yes. that, I mean, politics may be illegal, but there's, it, it almost seems a little bit unserious. Go well, to exile, the, this is the fifth time we're saying, this is like, they're no more serious about their revolutionaries than we are about visa holders in this country, right? Yeah, but they didn't have telephones. Right. And the distances are very large, the communications are very primitive. And the officials are susceptible to bribery, in addition to the fact that they drink and may be incompetent. The czarist regime is a failure. It cannot live up to its own aims and ambitions. It wants to be one of the great powers in the world. Mm -hmm. And being one of the great powers in the world means competing with Britain, competing with France, right? competing with Germany. The czarist Russia's better government raises more revenue, bigger army, more competent administration than the Ottoman Empire, than the Qing Dynasty in China. But that's not the league it's playing in. It's playing in the absolute top leagues. And the pressure to play in that top league with a less educated population, a less literate population, with you know, a great deal more territory to cover, and overall, with less industry and modernity to compete. And so the Tsarist regime is in a pressure cooker. It's fighting for its survival when it wants to be, it has the ambitions of being one of the great powers. Now inside that, it's got these opponents. The opponents are not only the revolutionaries in the underground. Mm -hmm. The opponents are in the establishment. One of the stories about the revolution that I try to tell is revolutions happen when the establishment revolts against the political system. People in the street can revolt or not revolt. Peasants, workers can go on strike or rebel. That's not a revolution. A revolution is when your establishment cuts and runs, and the czarist regime loses its establishment. This means that uh, it's not as tight as an authoritarian regime would be today. When you say it loses its establishment, you're talking about rich landholders who have big houses in Petersburg and Moscow. You're talking about the top army officials. Yes. You're talking about the handful of industrialists. Yes. It's a very small elite given that, by contrast with the size of the country, maybe a few hundred families intermarried and so forth. He loses them? Yes, the ministers, the local governors, for example, right? If you feel that the regime is incompetent, if you feel that the regime loses a war with Japan, which is an Asiatic country, as they said at the time, right, you begin to lose confidence in the ability of this regime going forward, and you might not go out on a limb to the same extent. In addition, the officials that are in the 
far-off remote locales are not your best people. They're in far-off locales often because they're not as good as those officials who have been drawn to provincial capitals, let alone the court society. And so many of the police that Stalin deals with are local people who have some education, two or three years, or no education. And, his, and he can take them because he's smarter he and tougher sweet and sweet talks them, or he uh, outsmarts them, or he bribes them, or he just manages somehow to collude with other officials to get. And so this back and forth, in and out of exile, is not a sign that the czarist regime didn't take the prisoners seriously. It's a sign that the prisoners were not so stupid, the official, officials were not so competent, and overall, the regime had a brittleness, a rickety quality. And so this didn't mean that the revolutionaries were going to come to power, right? Most people assumed that the constitutionalists would come to power, those people that we would call the liberal in the classical sense, for rule of law, private property, you know, constitutional Democrats, as the party was called. This was the vision that most people had for changing Tsarist Russia. Some had the revolutionary socialist vision, but they were in the underground, in Siberia, in European exile, right? right. They were oppressed by the police. Now, I'm going to do it, something very dirty, which is try to compress into three sentences hmm. volumes of history. 1905, revolution takes place, a Duma is established, the Tsar grants it official standing, there's back and forth, back and forth. Is this society going to become liberal in the classical sense? Is it going to become parliamentary like the great nations of Western Europe, or is it not? It doesn't work very well, and then the whole experiment gets buried in the, when, with the outbreak of the First World War. Fair enough, crude, but fair enough uh, for at top speed. You got it, Peter. Okay. And then in 1917, the country suffers not one, but two revolutions. Can you distinguish for us the February from the October revolutions of 1917? Uh, 1917 revolutions take place during the war. World War I is still going. Now, the Germans are going to win on the Eastern Front. This is something people forget. In March 1918, there's going to be a, a peace treaty acknowledging German victory in World War I. So, Brest-Litovsk. Brest-Litovsk treaty, you're exactly right. right. But until then, right, the war is continuing. So the revolutionary events take place during the war. Because the perception is the czarist regime, and especially Nicholas II, the czar, are not managing the war properly, the generals begin to think that they need to restore order, get a grip on the situation politically in order to win the war effort. Now, the generals are not looking for power themselves. It's not a military coup. They latch on to a faction inside the Duma or the quasi-parliament. But it's the generals who talk Nicholas II into abdicating. Now, they think he should abdicate in favor of his son, who's a teenager, but also a hemophiliac. And there's no cure for hemophilia. And if the son bumps into a chair, he can bleed to death. And so Nicholas is very afraid of what could happen to his son. Moreover, an abdicate, a czar who abdicates has to leave the country. And so Nicholas would have to leave his son, Alexei, the teenage hemophiliac, and go into exile, which he refuses to do. So at the last minute, Nicholas talked into it by his generals who are trying to preserve the system and fight the war better, while the capital, St. Petersburg, renamed Petrograd during the war, while the capital is in flames, the garrison is in revolt in the capital, Nicholas is at the front, the generals talk him into abdicating, he abdicates at the last minute, he abdicates in favor of his brother. His brother hasn't been consulted. When the brother is consulted, he says, I don't think so. I'm not going to take over. So Russia becomes a republic by accident, meaning no monarchy. The 300-plus-year-old Romanov dynasty ends because Nicholas abdicated at the last second in favor of his brother, not his son. With the Mikhail, Grand Duke? Yes, okay. exactly right. So stop there for a moment. If Mikhail had said, thank you, Nicholas, all my life I sort of wished I had been born first. This is a great job. Yes. The generals would have rallied. This would, that would have stopped the revolution. 
We don't know, of course, because that's a counterfactual, but it's an interesting thought you've just had. The generals thought that Alexei, who was a kind of cherubic teenage, young teenage boy, would rally the nation. That they would see this see. guy Alexei and they'd say, Such let's a be patriotic. Right. Whether Mikhail had the political touch or not. You know, political touch is a gift, and you either have it or you don't. In one of our famous uh, political families here in the United States, one of them, the male, had the political touch, and we see the other one, the female, lacks the political touch. She just doesn't have it, and it's visible every day, right? And then right. voters can see whether you have So whether Mikhail was up to the task of stepping in Nicholas II's shoes, had he had that ambition, rem is unclear to me. But nonetheless, the intention was not to validate the garrison's revolt in the capital, but instead to restore order, win the war on the Eastern Front against Germany and Austria, and survive. This is a conservative, an attempt at a conservative Correct. revolution. Got now, it. the Duma faction that the generals latch on to, Nicholas has never liked the Duma. He conceded it grudgingly in 1906. He's been trying, scheming with various courtiers to abolish it. He prorogues the Duma during the war, which means he just says, we, you don't need to meet. Go home. I'll handle the war myself. Don't call us. We'll call you. Yes, that's exactly right. And so they're kind of itching because they feel that they can do a better job with the war effort than Nicholas can. And also they're in favor of a constitutional monarchy, meaning where they themselves had the kind of power that you have, like in Britain, for example, mm -hmm. where the parliament is supreme. And so they're ambitious in the Duma. They collude with the generals. They take over and form something called the provisional government. The provisional government, the downfall of the Tsar, sometimes known as the February Revolution, but because they have a different calendar in Eastern Orthodoxy, it actually it takes place in March on the Western calendar. But it's known as the February Revolution. So here we have no more Tsar. The generals are now going to continue to fight the war effort. The Duma is going to try to rule. But in fact, the provisional government, the members of the Duma that have announced themselves as provisional, they're provisional because they're supposed to be a constitutional convention. Right. And, and that's going to validate their power. But in the meantime, they're provisional. They don't call the Duma into session. So the members of the Duma that had been prorogued by Nicholas II conduct themselves a coup against their own Duma and rule as a self-appointed body, kind of French Revolution style. They're unable to win the war. They continue the war. They can't fix the food crisis because the war is a difficult problem to manage. A total war, one society against another society, mobilization of all resources, problems with transport, problems with getting the grain to the cities and to the army, you know, because armies and cities don't grow their own the, grain. The army was, as I recall, they had by this time roughly three million men deployed. Is that the right number? Yeah, you have about five million at the peak. Okay. And you have 15 million who serve in the army at any given point okay. during the so war. So at a very minimum, they have to solve the problem of feeding five million men. And then the industrial cities need food because the reason that there was an uprising in the capital which the generals then were motivated to take Nicholas down was because the women were marching for bread. It wasn't just the workers striking in the, cap, in the, in the, in the factories. And so okay. what you've got here is you've got a difficult wartime situation that the self-appointed men of the provisional government are not up to handling. The provisional government goes through several incarnations, including Alexander Kerensky, who becomes the prime minister, the head of it, in the, in the middle here. We're talking about the summer of 1917. Kerensky will eventually go into exile and spend the rest of his life here at the Hoover Institution with an office on the second floor of the Hoover Tower, writing his memoirs about how it wasn't his fault. But in the meantime, the war's going on, and yeah. they decide to go on the offensive. Even though the army is in rags, and they don't have enough rifles, and there's all sorts of other problems, they decide to go on the offensive. The offensive works a little bit at first, but then the soldiers decide they don't want to do it. They essentially have a soldier strike. The offensive fails. The provisional government is on the verge of dissolution. And at this point, Stalin's going to enter the picture because these ragtag underground revolutionaries 
who are in far-off Siberia or European exile, once the Tsar falls and freedom is declared, they flock back to the capital, Petrograd, and they make their own plans for revolution. And that's where you're going to get the October coup in 1917. Which is a coup. There's no question it's a coup, yes. All right. So, 1917, the second revolution, the coup takes place. Lenin stands by himself. He's clearly yes. the acknowledged leader of this. But then in the next level, you've got Stalin, Trotsky, Bukharin, Rykov, Zinoviev, Kamenev, uh, others, Kaganovich. Yes. So Stalin yes. at this point in 1917 is one of a dozen, 18 people under Lenin. And within five years, yes. he becomes the undisputed dictator of this country. How did that happen? Yeah, thank you. That's a really big story, too, Peter. So what we have here is... By the way, he's still fairly young by... Yeah, born in 1878, so he's 39 years old in 1917, right. about to be 39. He's close to Lenin. Lenin is his meal ticket. Lenin is his mentor. Stalin, er, early on, his first meetings with Lenin, he's actually not that impressed. This is information that will subsequently be suppressed by the Soviet authorities, but we now have it again. Nonetheless, he hitches his wagon to Lenin. And Lenin, as you said, is the singular figure. He's the guy that's going to take these people to power. Uh, will, determination, but also tactical flexibility. What people don't understand about Lenin is that he had very deep ideas that he would not relinquish. But he was willing to do whatever was necessary in order to realize those ideas, including repudiate those ideas for a time, what we call ultimate tactical flexibility. And Stalin went to school. He studied Lenin. He became Lenin's pupil. There are a handful of people around Lenin. Stalin is not alone. But there are only four people inside the inner regime already from October, November 1917. And Stalin is one of those four people. And these four people, we get limited from a dozen or half a dozen to four because Lenin effectively selects them. Yes, he does. And they're Trotsky, somebody named Yakov Sverdlov, who's going to die in 1919, uh, looks like from disease. There's an a kind actual of epidemic. natural death, one of the few in your yes. books. All right. Yes, so there's an epidemic. He, he does, dies from disease in 1919. He's the kind of Stalin before Stalin in many ways. He's a great organizer. He's not really a public speaker. He's not really a charismatic figure, but he gets things done. He's a doer, a practical type. Sverdlov, Stalin, Trotsky, and Lenin. This is your regime in 1917. They're the ones empowered to sign government decrees, and they're the ones who meet most often with Lenin and are closest to Lenin. So what we have is Sverdlov's going to die, as we said, in 1919. Trotsky, Stalin, and Lenin. Nobody thinks that Lenin is going anywhere. It's clear that he's the acknowledged leader by everybody. It's clear that he has these political capabilities. He makes a lot of mistakes, and he does things Still that... Still relatively young, vigorous. There's no cloud of correct. Ill, Ill health. Correct. But it turns out he's got several illnesses, debilitating illnesses, and he's going to pass from the scene. So people often ask him, Peter, when does Stalin get in power? When does Stalin become a dictator? And I think that's an excellent question. I tried to answer it in the book, once again, with the original primary documents, only taking stuff that was said in real time and following closely the levers of power. So what happens is Lenin, who's the head of the government, which means he's kind of the equivalent of prime minister, chairman of the Council of People's Commissars or the government in the Soviet case, commissars instead of ministers. Lenin appoints Stalin general secretary of the Communist Party. Now, this is a new position, entirely new, that he's created mm -hmm. only for Stalin. Mm -hmm. It's clear that Lenin's done this. We have the documents in his hand. It's clear that he's chosen Stalin. It's clear that he knows what he's doing. Stalin is already performing these functions for Lenin, right-hand man, organizer, head of the party, while Lenin runs the government and makes the big policy decisions. This happens in April 1922. So the Civil War has happened. The Reds have won the Civil War. Trotsky's had a prominent role as the head of the army, the commissar for war. Everybody knows Trotsky. That's very interesting because Trotsky's not only an intellectual and an orator. He's the flashy figure. Yes. But it turns out 
he is able to take this ragtag op operation, this failure that the, the Germans smashed, yes. and turn them into an effective fighting force as the Red Army, and he's brutal. Yes, Trotsky... So he's, he's a doer and a talker. Trotsky is effective during the Civil War. There's okay. no question. Okay. One, but once again, under Lenin's leadership. All right. Stalin has a very prominent role in the Civil War, too, not as prominent as Trotsky's role. And Stalin is not as well known as Trotsky. But in terms of being close to Lenin, Stalin is at least as close to Lenin, if not more, than Trotsky is. And Lenin relies on both of them. But in April 1922, Lenin makes Stalin general secretary of the Communist Party. Right. Trotsky remains the war commissar at this point. Now, the Communist Party is, in many ways, the ideological and personnel heart of the regime. And so it's a very important position. Stalin will begin to take the position seriously and make it into something and create a personnel machine and an ideological machine, which doesn't really yet exist. This is something he's got to create. Remember, dictatorship is a creation, right? It's something that you've got to make and sustain. It's an achievement. It's not something that just happens. But what happens? Stalin appointed general secretary of the party in April 1922, and in May 1922, Lenin has a stroke. He has a debilitating stroke. So the number one guy has a stroke, and the number two guy, who was never intended by Lenin to be number one, because Lenin didn't intend to step aside, is all of a sudden in this position where he's got the levers of power in his hands. The general secretary of the party controls the liaison with the secret police, controls the liaison with the military, controls the liaison with foreign policy, with the embassies abroad, has the cipher codes, communicates all the information to the local party organizations around the country, receives all the secret information. So it's the clearinghouse, it's the center of power, because the Communist Party, right, was loyal, was trusted, was the movement, was what Lenin relied on. Now, Stalin could have said, you know, this is not right. It's unfair to me. It's unfair to the other guys that I have all of this power all of a sudden. Should I control the secret police by myself? That's not fair. Why don't I share? Should I control all the cipher codes by myself? Why not share? In other words, Stalin could have been a different kind of personality. He could have been self-effacing. He could have been more collegial. But instead, of course, he was who we know he came to be. Ruthless, cunning, ambitious, and so he grabs these levers that have been put into his hands by Lenin, and with Lenin's stroke, Stalin's going to create a personal dictatorship inside the Bolshevik dictatorship. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson, professor of history at Princeton and a fellow here at the Hoover Institution. Stephen Kotkin knows more about Joseph Stalin than anyone who has ever lived. And now, part two of our interview with Stephen Kotkin on the Soviet dictator. Uncommon Knowledge, now. Lenin's last will and testament. Describe what it is and why it mattered. The other fellows didn't just sit back and say, Joe, okay, fine, you got lucky, it's yours. There's months of struggle. Well, you know, Stalin's in power, Peter. So the struggle is about removing Stalin from power. Zinoviev is not in power. Kamenev is not in power. Trotsky is not in power. Stalin is the general secretary of the party. Already in 1922-23, we have correspondence. Stalin is writing to secret police officials, and they are writing back to him in his role as general secretary of the party. He's recruiting them to his side. He's getting them to be his bagmen, to do his dirty business against potential rivals in the party. In addition, Zinoviev and Kamenev and others begin a correspondence. Geez, this is not right. Stalin is making decisions without consulting us. Stalin behind our backs is appointing these people and those people. Well, that was Stalin's job. 
He was general secretary of the party. And there's the press of events. There's all sorts of decisions that have to be made when you're the center of power. And he's making the decisions. He's, in Stalin's point of view, from his point of view, he's got the whole regime on his back. And he's working 24-7. But from their point of view, he's making decisions behind their backs without their consultation. So they begin to wonder, what could we do about this? Meanwhile, Lenin is sick. He's living in a country house in a settlement called Gorky, not Maxim Gorky. This is a different Gorky, G-O-R-K-I. Mm -hmm. It's southwest of Moscow. He's got a doctor, nurses, attendants. His wife, the longstanding wife, Krupskaya, who's also his secretary in some ways, and his uh, unwed sister, Maria Ulyanova. This is the Lenin entourage. He's almost never in the Kremlin, never in the capital, Moscow. He's outside on this estate. The doctors think one diagnosis is it's overwork, and so therefore he should work less, so they try to reduce his workload. His mind is going. He loses, he's paralyzed. He loses the ability to write. He loses the ability to speak. The whole right side of his body is paralyzed. He tries to write a little bit left-handed. This is a guy who's collected volumes, you know, run to 55 total volumes, his collected works, not including what was suppressed, right? And now he's lost the ability to write and in some ways the ability to speak. So he's isolated. He wants to be involved in politics. The doctors say he shouldn't be. And Stalin is in charge of overseeing Lenin because Stalin's in charge of overseeing everything. And so what we see is Lenin thinks he might come back. He's trying to come back. The others are wondering whether he'll come back. He has further strokes until finally he's going to die in January 1924 after the fourth stroke. Right? All this time between May 1922, the first stroke, and January 1924, there's this ambiguity. Who's going to succeed Lenin? Did he appoint a successor? What would be the procedures of succession? Should there be a single successor or maybe a committee or a collegial body to take over? But remember, Stalin has the levers of power in and his he's hand. he's doing the job. Right. Okay. He's enacting the role of general secretary of the party, which people appreciate because he's getting a lot done. As I show in the book, he was very adept at being general secretary of the party. He was not a genius. He was blind to many things. He made enormous numbers of mistakes. He learned on the job. But still, at dictatorship, he had an aptitude. And the others decide something should be done. Now, what happens, strangely, is there's a party congress without Lenin. This happens in the spring of 1923. And the and party congress is an annual event by annual? How often yes, it's an annual, annual event, event, and it's the highest decision-making body of the party. And so the party congress is kind of where things get thrashed out. The party congress that takes place in the spring of 1923, uh, Trotsky has his platform, Stalin has his platform, Stalin is the one who has the organizational muscle, and so Trotsky is crushed at this party congress, and it's clear that Stalin has the levers of power. Now, formally, he's in a triumvirate or a threesome with Zinoviev and Kamenev, but they're the ones complaining behind his back that he's exercising power without them. So the triumvirate is a little bit of a facade. Right. And as I say, Trotsky is crushed at this party congress. Now, all of a sudden, in May 1923, a document emerges, which is attributed to Lenin, his supposed dictation. He's still alive at this point. He's alive, you know, between May 22, the first stroke, and January 24. This is spring, May 1923, so a year after the first stroke. A document emerges from Lenin which says, uh, this person's not that good, and this person's not that good, has bad things to say about all potential successors, six that Lenin chose to name, supposedly, in this document. But Trotsky comes out better than the others in the document. And Lenin's wife, Nadezhda Krupskaya, hands the document to Zinoviev in May 1923. They've known each other for a long time because they were in Zurich together in the uh, European emigration before 1917, and Krupskaya was very friendly with Zinoviev's wife. Hands it to him. It's dated December 1922. Supposed dictation by Lenin. The document comes forward and has no effect. It doesn't dislodge Stalin. It doesn't reduce his power. It doesn't affect the succession struggle whereby Stalin's in power 
Zinoviev and Kamenev are in this facade, threesome with Stalin, and Trotsky's out of power. Krupskaya is not necessarily on Trotsky's side. She, however, doesn't want Stalin to be the sole successor to Lenin. She's looking more for a collective collegial mm -hmm. body because Lenin individually is irreplaceable in her mind. The document that comes forward has no effect. And then in June 1923, a second document comes forward, also attributed to Lenin, supposedly his dictation, which is now going to become so-called Lenin's Testament that you were referring to. And this document is allegedly dictated in January 1923. That's the date that Krupskaya has given it, which means that in May 1923, when she handed the first document over, the second document supposedly existed already. already. Existed. But she didn't hand it in together. But the first one failed. And then she hands in a second one, and the second one says, remove Stalin. So here it is, a little more than a year since Lenin has created the position of general secretary of the party. And now Lenin is allegedly calling for Stalin's removal from General Secretary of the Party. It's a sensational document. It's amazing that something like this comes forward because Stalin's ability uh, to remain in power against Lenin's wishes would be very dubious because Lenin is the acknowledged, still alive and the acknowledged this is leader. published in Pravda. How does it, how does it, how do the people find out The document is it? handed or shown, we're not sure, once again by Krupskaya to Zinoviev. And Zinoviev is on holiday in Kislevosk, a southern resort town that has mineral water baths, Kislevodi, acidic waters, Kislevosk. And he goes up in a cave up there on the mountainside with somebody named Bukharin and two others to talk about what to do. Here's a dictation attributed to Lenin calling for Stalin's removal. Now, Zinoviev is a very ambitious guy, Peter. He's forced Stalin to give him the job of giving the political report at the just concluded party congress, which Lenin had always given. Mm -hmm. And Stalin acceded and allowed Zinoviev that high profile spotlight of giving the report that Lenin usually gave. So you can't say Zinoviev is not ambitious for himself. But instead of saying, okay, let's call a meeting immediately in Moscow and let's enact Lenin's wishes, let us remove Stalin. Zinoviev concocts this crazy scheme of implanting himself and one other person in the secretariat of the party alongside Stalin, because Zinoviev has figured out that that's where the power is. And he writes a letter back to Stalin in Moscow. Oh, there's a letter from Lenin about the general secretary position. And this is what we propose. And Stalin says, there's what? There's a letter from Lenin? Now, let's backtrack a tiny bit here. Let's talk about Lenin and Gorky at the estate. We have the doctor's journals recording his activities or actually his inactivities, his inability to write, his inability to speak, his massive headaches, just a debilitated situation. We have other documents at the time testifying also to Lenin's difficulties. But now somehow we have dictation coming from him calling for Stalin's removal. It's very suspicious. We don't know in the end if Lenin dictated these documents or not. We don't know if his wife interpolated his thoughts. What's your, nobody's looked at it more closely than you. Well, there is no document. This is the problem. You go to the archives in Moscow and you say, can I read the Testament of Lenin? And you'll get a typescript. Now, in all other matters of dictation, there's a stenographic handwritten document. Right. Because if somebody's speaking and you're the secretary, you're writing down not every word, but abbreviations, initials, and then you go back to your office, you go back to the typewriter, and you type it up, and then you show it to the boss, and the boss initials it, even if the boss can only initial it left-handed, because his right hand is paralyzed. But we don't have a document. There is no original stenographic account of Lenin's, quote, dictation. Now, there are other documents around this time that are Lenin's dictation with the handwritten stenographic version. This one, no. All we've got is a typescript. Moreover, the content of the typescript is changing over time. 
There's going to be a different version in 1923 compared to 1922. There's going to be a different version later in 1923. There's going to be a different version published in 1927. It first becomes Lenin's testament when it's circulated underground by the Trotskyites, who get called to account for circulating the document, which they've affixed the title Lenin's testament to. And there's a hearing... Uh, Felix Dzerzhinsky, the head of the secret police, which says you, you're not allowed to circulate this document. And that's another version of the document that we have, the Trotskyite one that's circulated. So we don't have the original. We have suspicious circumstances of its emergence. We have the convenient fact for Trotsky, Zinoviev, Kamenev, and Krupskaya that it calls for Stalin's removal. But once again, Zinoviev has not enacted the removal. He's concocted a different version implant himself next to Stalin in the Secretariat. Now, think about this, Peter. If Stalin was a maniac, if he was a sociopath, if he was dangerous and a murderer, and you had a document from Lenin calling for his removal, just for self-preservation, you would say, let's get this done. Let's remove this guy. Right. Let alone what your personal ambition might be to replace him. You want to save the revolution. You want to save yourself physically. Zinoviev writes to Kamenev, who's back in Moscow, st working with Stalin, while Zinoviev is in this resort, right. this mineral water town, Kislovodsk. And Kamenev says, now this is a guy, Kamenev, who's known Stalin for 20 years at this point, since 1903. We're in the spring, summer of 1923. He's known him for 20 years. And Kamenev is the guy who gave Stalin the copy of Machiavelli's The Prince in Russian translation. So he's not a naive person. Right. You can't call Kamenev naive. Kamenev says, it's not a problem. We don't have to remove Stalin. We don't have to put anybody else in the secretariat. Kamenev nixes the Zinoviev idea, which is a reaction to the Lenin document. So the, from the moment... Lenin makes him the general secretary. There's never really a serious... He's, he never teeters on the verge of falling out of power. If these guys had followed Lenin's supposed wishes, if they had taken that dictation, gone to Moscow, called a meeting, held up the paper, and taken a vote, Stalin was out. But they decided not to. And Kamenev is the critical figure here. Because... Once again, people talk about how Stalin's a sociopath. Right. And, and, and I follow only in real time right. what they said about him. And if he was a sociopath, Kamenev would have known because he had known him 20 years. Either we kill him now or we go to Switzerland. Right. Those are the two choices if you're dealing with a dangerous man. Right. But instead, Kamenev takes Stalin's side and blocks Zinoviev's maneuver. And the testament from Lenin is not enacted in the spring summer of 1923, but it doesn't go away. Within within the scope of this book, 1928, do we know that Stalin is a killer? Volume two, we deal with the purges of the 30s. We deal with, with the effects of his decision to yes. collectivize the. We deal with the famine. Yes. We know in volume two that he's a. Do we know by the end of volume one that he's a killer? We're beginning to see. And why, by I say we, I'm talking about those who are around him working most closely with him, his closest colleagues. We begin to see in 1927, 1928, that the malevolence is manifesting itself. All right. but, we, but we only catch glimpses of this. We don't see the full version of it. And they themselves are not sure, is this really who Stalin is? Or is this just a mood he's going through, a phase he's going through that will pass? So you have, so in this book, by the time this book ends in 1928, Stalin is, has been for some years the undisputed ruler of the Soviet yes. Union. And he has not achieved that position by wiping out his enemies. That will follow. But he becomes ruler of the Soviet Union through sheer cunning and for force he's of personality, recruiting, hard work, intelligence, yes, right? Yes, he's recruiting people to his side, he's building institutions, and he's building loyalists throughout the institutions. Now, you gave a lecture last winter in which you said, and I was sitting in mm. the back of the room taking notes, so this is a direct quotation, mm. the old way of thinking is that Stalin did what he did to consolidate his power. No, I'm quoting you. 
He did what he did because he was a communist. Yes. Explain. So what's the big story of the secret archives? What's the big story from all those classified documents that were hidden from us all those years, which in the past 20 years, especially the past 15, have been revealed? And the big secret is, behind closed doors, they spoke the same language, they said the same things as they said in their propaganda. People thought, oh, you know, when we read the secret documents, we're finally going to get the story. Oh, no more nonsense about the working class and the bourgeoisie and the imperialists, and they're going to talk what they really, oh, we can relax now. We're off camera, we're behind the scenes, all that crap about the proletariat, the hell with that. We're a traditional great power, how do we, right. Right, but instead, behind closed scenes, here they are talking about the proletariat, the kulaks, the imperialists, the bourgeoisie, all the Marxian categories. Because it turns out that the communists were communists. They believed in the ideas. And it's only by taking the ideas and the politics seriously can you understand the phenomenon. Now, some people during the Cold War understood this. Robert Conquest here at the Hoover Institution, for example, fully understood that these people were communists. But even smart people, the minority, who understood that the ideas and the communism mattered, nonetheless thought that Stalin's primary motivation was personal power. But he had the personal power already, Peter. That's one of the things the book shows, I hope meticulously, with the original documents. From this period of spring 1922, when he's appointed general secretary, through January 1928, when he takes a trip to Siberia and announces that he has to collectivize agriculture, during that period of five and a half years, he has accumulated an incredible amount of power. He's built this dictatorship inside the dictatorship, as you said, through hard work, cunning, intelligence, and also because he stands for something. People perceive him to stand for the values that they had fought the revolution for. He's to their guy. To use Margaret Thatcher's phrase, he was a conviction politician. Yes, he was, and people appreciate that. I mean, obviously, he's a very different politician from Margaret Thatcher. Margaret Thatcher, a different outlook on the world and a different political system she's operating in. But yes, Margaret Thatcher was a woman of convictions, and that's one of the reasons she was a great politician. So, Stephen, a few... This is television, alas. We can't... We, I would love to have you to myself for the next five hours. Are you free for the next That's five hours this afternoon? Of you. That's very kind. So, a few closing questions here. I'm doing a little bit of a dirty trick because I'm about to give you a couple of quotations that anticipate a later volume of this, but hmm. this has just puzzled me for years. Two quotations here. Here's Winston Churchill writing to his wife from Moscow in 1944. Quote, I have had very nice talks, nice talks with the old bear, which was his term for Stalin. I like him the more I see him, close quote. Harry Truman, hmm. writing to his wife from Potsdam in the summer hmm. of 1945, quote, I like Stalin. He's straightforward, close quote. Winston Churchill hmm. and Harry Truman are two of the shrewdest judges of character yes. the 20th century produced, and they liked Stalin. You've now spent a big part of your life in the company of Joseph Stalin. Do you feel the appeal? Do you find yourself liking the guy? Well, Peter, he was a charismatic figure, especially in a closed-door setting, in a one-on-one -on -one or a small, narrow group, right? Look at the photograph on the cover of the book. This is an unretouched photograph from 1927. Very few photographs of Stalin are unretouched. Usually, they dress him up. And in fact, in removing the pock marks and other marks on his face, you lose the charisma of the eyes, mm. the glance, right, the brain that you can see there. Here, I believe, in this photograph, you can see some of that. And that's what people also saw when they were in closed, very close quarters with him. He definitely could charm people. He could charm all sorts of political figures who were very shrewd. This didn't mean that he didn't have another side to him. 
a vicious side, a malevolent side, a cunning side that some interlocutors did manage to see when meeting with him and some didn't manage to see. But Stalin also often kept his word in these negotiations. If he promised to do something to another world leader, he would often enact that promise. Now, he wouldn't promise things he didn't want to do. So there were many things he kept quiet about. After Yalta, Churchill goes back and stands up in the House of Commons and says, I think I can quote it exactly, I know of no government that keeps to its word better than the Soviet government. An amazing statement. Yes, unfortunately, that's a false statement, obviously, and he was misled in that regard. Or he was trying to get something done in a political sense where he needed to say he things. He wanted Greece, I think, but that... He needed to say separate, things that right. others would uh, go along with him. In the end, you know, I don't really like Stalin. He's not a figure that you come to like. When you see what his power did, the consequences of his rule, the millions of people enslaved, deported executed, died on behalf of a crazy lunatic ideology, the people he tortured, not personally, but the ones that he ordered to be tortured, and the ones that he tortured psychologically, and that's personal. The more you know about him, the more impossible it is to ever like him, to ever feel mm -hmm. the, the humanity of him in some human way. But I'll tell you something, he's awesome. Nobody accumulated more power than Stalin. Nobody exercised more power than Stalin. So from a purely political standpoint, from the standpoint of dictatorship, he's the gold standard. Not in the moral sense, obviously, but in the pure power sense, it's breathtaking. And so there's an awe-inspiring quality to him at the same time as there's deep revulsion about so, how we use the power. Last couple of questions, Stephen. Here's one of them. <clears throat> Reagan, very famously in 1983, referred to the Soviet Union as an evil empire um, and said we were caught up in, quote, a struggle between right and wrong and good and evil. Right, wrong, good, evil. To a professional politician, are these categories even legitimate? Is it possible to understand Stalin in the whole without them? Once you accept the premises of the regime, once you accept the premises of the Marxism, once you accept the premises of the ideology, Stalin was true to the ideals. The problem is, is I don't accept those premises. I don't accept Marxism. I don't accept communist ideology. And so therefore, what Stalin did was criminal. It was evil. There's no doubt about it. But evil is more interesting the more human it becomes the more contextual it becomes, the more part of the, Russian, the sweep of Russian history it becomes. Evil becomes more understandable when it's actually bigger than a single person in addition to being that single person. So even if you reject the communist ideology as I do, understanding it and taken seriously is a part of understanding Stalin's criminality and his evil. You know, the Cold War was about something real. Mm. It was not a misunderstanding. We have this crazy notion that if they just talked more, if they just got together more, if they just could understand each other better, that there wouldn't have been a Cold War or we could have avoided the Cold War. It's bunk. The Cold War was to contain the Soviet menace, and the Soviet Union was a menace not only to its neighbors but to its own people. The Cold War was necessary, and in that sense, Reagan was right. And so speaking about criminality and evil is certainly possible in the political realm. Do you know that I almost weep for relief to hear a tenured professor at Princeton University say, say such things, Stephen? Well, that's Did you overlap with George Kennan at all? Truth is a powerful argument. That's all I've okay. got to say. Here's my last question. Again, I'm going to quote Stalin. Stalin, volume one. And would you please hurry up and finish the next two? Mm. Stalin, volume one. I'm quoting you. Actually, I'm quoting a quotation within you. you. You start by quoting a historian yourself. More than almost any other great man in history, wrote the historian E.H. Carr, Stalin illustrates the thesis that circumstances make the man, not the man the circumstances. Close quote. And then Stephen Kotkin writes, utterly, eternally wrong. Unfortunately, you know, Carr was a great historian. He did a lot of work. He's still very influential to this day. He trained several students who are very prominent. But he got a couple of things wrong. He apologized for Stalin, and he appeased Hitler. Mm 
in editorial newspaper, unsigned newspaper editorials. It's hard to get both of those things wrong, uh, but he managed to get both of those things wrong. But with Stalin, he never really got to the bottom of Stalin. And he made Stalin, like Trotsky did the same thing, out to be a representative of something else rather than an individual actor on his own terms. Ironically, Stalin will do the same with Hitler. Stalin misunderstands Hitler to a certain extent as a representative of the capitalist system in decline, of finance capital. Stalin fails to appreciate that Hitler is an individual actor who can create his own circumstances the same way that Stalin was able to do, as I show in volume Steve, two. So I just said that was the last question, but here's the last question. Hmm. I am really puzzled about your standing within your profession as a professional historian. You just said the Soviet Union was a menace, the Cold War was necessary, yes. the idea that we misunderstood them is bunk, that was your term, bunk, and here you have just said, men make history. And of course that runs against an enormous amount of work by historians in the late 20th century, mid to late 20th century, saying, whoa, 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 whoa. For the great man idea of history, please, 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 let's all calm down. There are large historical forces at work in which we're all caught up and we are, hmm. if not corks on the ocean, we're hmm. more affected by events than we affect them. Great man, please. And Stephen Kotkin comes along and says, oh yeah? Read this. Look what he did. Yes. How do your colleagues look upon you? Well, I do political history. Uh, political history is not so much in vogue. Cultural history is pretty much the predominant practice in the academy today. Social history was the predominant practice in the 70s and 80s and still survives to a very great extent, but cultural history has really taken over. But I do political history, I do diplomatic history, I do geopolitics, I do power. This is the thing, the structuralists are not wrong. You know, history is a landscape. It's a landscape of possibilities and limitations. Once you sketch in the structures, the big landscape, world prices for grain, the size of somebody's army, the geography in which they're located, the nature of their neighbors, the political institution. You sketch in all the various different structures and then you have the historical landscape of possibilities and limitations. It's on that historical landscape that people act or don't act. That's how we begin to understand historical agency in that big structural landscape. But the structural landscape doesn't move itself. It has to be moved by agency. It has to be moved by actors, sometimes small people, sometimes great people. And so what you see with Stalin is an ability to shift the structural landscape, to find levers onto socioeconomic engineering and geopolitics that very few other people are going to find. And we have to explain that, and we have to show the consequences of that. Stephen, you old-fashioned man, you, you believe in free will. Yes, you I You believe do. it illuminates the whole drama, or drives the whole drama. I believe it's very important. You're absolutely right. Yes. Stephen Kotkin of Princeton University and the Hoover Institution and the author of this magnificent book, Stalin, Paradoxes of Power, 1878 to 1928, Volume 1. Will you please hurry up with Volumes 2 and 3? Thank you. For Uncommon Knowledge, I'm Peter Robinson. Mm -hmm.